Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations in all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. I don't know if it feels like a new year to you or not. We talked about last week that this is, last week was the end of calendar year C. We are beginning calendar year A in the lectionary. It is the beginning of a new liturgical season, the beginning of a new year. It's the beginning of a new month. And so we go to Romans chapter 13, verses 11 through 14 to hear what God has to say to us here at the beginning of things, but also as we continue in this journey of life together. Let us now with open hearts and with soft spirits listen as God speaks to us through God's word. Besides this, you know what time it is. It is now the mo- how it is now the moment for you to wake from your sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone. The day is near. Let us lay aside the works of darkness and to put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not in reveling or drunkenness, not in debauchery or licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. May this God's word speak to our hearts, our minds, our spirits, This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hope everybody enjoyed the long, longer weekend as it was. I look forward to long weekends. I like to sleep in. Now, sleeping in for me means something different now than when I was younger. Sleeping in is a nice 7 a.m., maybe a nice 7.15. I started thinking, when was the last time I got a honest-to-goodness great night's sleep. And I think it was around 2003. And, and those were good days. Those were really, really good days. They're good days now, too. The thing with being a parent is you recognize with kids, they have their own sleeping patterns. Sometimes you get night owls. Sometimes you get morning roosters. And sometimes you get both. And that's always fun as well. When I was a kid, with the five kids in our family, sleep was, I never thought about it because you got as much as you wanted, except when we were going on a big family trip. And some people like to get out early, maybe seven o'clock in the morning, maybe six o'clock in the morning. My dad was a 3.30 in the morning kind of guy. Get you to bed, would wake you up, put you in the van, put you in the car and say, now go back to sleep. And, and if it all worked out well, you'd wake up with the sun in Tennessee or wake up with the sun somewhere in western Oklahoma. And it was nice. And now that's different when I'm an adult because if I know there's a big trip the next day, I know if I have to leave early, if I want to beat traffic or get to the destination in a timely manner, I know that the alarm has to be set. But if you're like me, and I think judging by the last two services, a lot of you are like me. If you have to get up at four o'clock in the morning, it doesn't matter how much sleep you want to get. You're only getting 15 minutes at a time because you look at the clock over and over and over again. And when you finally get up, you're not rested at all for the big journey that is ahead of you. Now, this, the Bible over and over and over again, it tells us, it tells us to abide. And the word abide simply means to rest. It means to sleep, to be at peace. And there are times, in fact, many times that the instruction is simply to sleep. It's like holding a child right here to your chest and putting their head right on your neck. Where they can, you can feel that warm, that wonderful feeling of warm breath right here. And especially if the child is, is overly tired or is upset, you're just saying, be still, I've got you. Be still, I've got you. Don't fight, I've got you. This is what it means to abide in God, to simply be still and know that God is God. That's not what our scripture passage today says. Our scripture passage says, wakey, wakey. Get out of bed. Don't hit the snooze. Get up right now for your salvation is at hand. 
your salvation is near. You're, in fact, closer to it right now than you have ever been before. Get up. That's hard. It's hard sometimes. It's hard, especially this time of year. Advent falls in, in our hemisphere and in here at the darkest time of the year. In fact, last night I was, I was thinking, yesterday is a perfect example of what many people go through during this time of year. You wake up in the morning and it's cloudy and the fog rolls in sometime afternoon and you just don't know exactly what time the sun is setting. You're not getting any vitamin D on days like yesterday. Maybe the rest of the week I haven't looked at the long range forecast. In those, those times where the darkness or the grayness of the fog and the clouds, it moves right into the darkness and you wonder, will you ever see the light again? There are times where that sticks to our souls too. There are times where it feels if it wasn't for bad news, we'd have no news at all. There are times where you look at maybe big things like national or international events and politics, maybe small things, at least not as large interactions with family and, and maybe coming off Thanksgiving, some brokenness there. And you look at these things and you wonder when the gray went to the black and you wonder when the light is going to shine again. It's like you want to keep your house joyful. You want to keep your house and yourself hopeful. But every time you open the door, the leaves and the muck from the outside seem to race in. It can be hard to lift up the light of hope when we're honest. It can be hard because life can be hard and gray and dark around us. So I'm thinking about what Paul is saying to the church in Rome. He says, get up. Get up for salvation is near. But what is the context of this? Well, earlier in the chapter, you don't really understand what you read in the Bible. Read a little bit before, read a little bit after. Hopefully it'll start making a little bit more sense. If you read a little bit earlier, Paul is talking about all the commandments. You, you know, don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal, don't covet, don't want something that's not yours. And then Paul says at last, it's all summed up in the great commandment, the fulfillment of the law, which is love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's what Paul is saying. Get up, get out of bed and start getting after it. Sometimes, many times, the victory is simply getting out of bed. Many times the victory is simply not pulling the covers up or putting, or putting the pillow over our head. Sometimes it is getting out of bed and being open to the possibilities of what this day might have. It's open to the possibilities of the interactions that God has in store for you. It's open to interacting with our neighbors, both near and far, to, to carry their load, but also to share your load with them as well. Yesterday, in the midst of this week, you know, you've got Thanksgiving Thursday, and then you've got Black Friday, and you've got Small Business Saturday, and, and tomorrow is, what, Cyber Monday. And so here we are. We don't have a name for Sunday, I guess. Let's call it church. So you have church today. And, and so what's the, what's the good news? Well, we got a little bit of good news with our family yesterday. We went down the, to the Central West End, and we went down to uh, see, see It's a Wonderful Day in the Neighborhood. I know some of you have, have seen it. It's, it wasn't really what I expected, but it was wonderful in its own way. I encourage you to, to get a chance to go and see it. But, you know, in the Presbyterian Church, we don't have saints. We don't canonize people. But if we did, Fred Rogers would be pretty much at the top of the list, being a Presbyterian minister. And he would talk about over and over, we know, won't you be my neighbor? But what does it mean to be a neighbor? It means when you're with somebody, you are holy with them. It means when you're with somebody, they are the most important person in the world to you. It means that when you are with someone, you are wholly present, listening to them, seeing them, loving them. Love your neighbor as yourself. Get out of bed and get cracking. This can be hard in our lives. It can be hard in the month of December where we know for at least for the next three weeks we've got more darkness than light and the darkness will continue, it seems, 
to win. But that's why during Advent we light candles. We light candles while the darkness might be all around us. We know the truth from John's gospel that the light shines in the darkness. The darkness cannot overcome it. So that is our hope. That is our prayer. And yet we come today another day, another week, another month, another year perhaps, and we come to church saying, great, we're starting a new lectionary calendar, whatever that means. We come to church with the same anxieties and fears we maybe felt a year ago or five years ago or 50 years ago. And there are two ways to look at it. The first way to look at it is despondence. It's to look at it and say, feel like Sisyphus. You are constantly pushing that boulder up the hill only to have it roll back down and say, here I am again. And the other way to look at it is to say, we are a year closer, a day closer, a season closer. Paul wrote this letter to the church in Rome 2,000 years ago. We are 2,000 years closer to this salvation, the salvation of humanity. But for our individual salvation, it's not something that we say, well, let's wait till tomorrow or let's wait till next week or let's wait till next year. The scripture says now, now, now is the time. I've always liked the, the church patriarch St. Augustine. I don't know if many of you have read the Confessions. Any show of hands? It's not exactly fun reading, but it's more fun than most of the other patriarchs. And, and what St. Augustine, he was an interesting guy. He was, a, he was a guy that you'd want to go out and have a drink with. In fact, he had many drinks early in his life. He was a very smart and learned guy. He liked the darkness a lot. He, he liked to do his own thing. He was a, a religious explorer as it was. His mom, St. Monica, that's where we get the name Santa Monica, it's for Augustine's mom. His mom prayed for him every night, every day, prayed without ceasing that, that he would accept the call to which God placed on his heart that he would not pick up just yet. He was a guy, St. Augustine, who said, Lord, give me chastity, but not yet. Lord, Lord, give me the right path, but let me stay in the darkness for a little while longer. Well, finally, all these things have finally fallen down on his heart. And finally, his world was crushed. He was in a place of complete despondency. And he's sitting in a courtyard, he writes, sitting underneath a fig tree, almost crying out to God, how long, O oh God, will you be angry at me? How long will you hold my prior sins against me? How long will I be cut off from you? And then he says, because he'd been trying to read the scripture, he knew the scripture, but it wasn't a scripture for him at last. But he writes that in the next the next backyard or a couple backyards over, somewhere over the fence line, he heard children playing and they were singing some song that seemed to be familiar to him, them but was not familiar to him. And the words were, take up and read, take up and read. And he said in an instant, in a moment, as if a, a curtain had been swung wide open, light poured back into his life and his despondency was gone. And he went back to the scripture, to the passage that was open that he had been reading. And it was our passage from today. It was from Romans 13. It said, not in drunk is, drunkenness and licentiousness and, and all those, those words that sounded so good when I wrote them down on Tuesday and I realized we needed a thesaurus to get through our prayer of confession this morning. But, but not in any of these things of darkness, but in putting on Christ. Putting on Christ. Not in the place of the grayness of the darkness, but the light of Christ and it said, he writes, No further would I read, nor needed I. For instantly at the end of this sentence, by a light, as it were, of serenity infused into my heart, all the darkness of doubt vanished away. Because for so long, St. Augustine has been praying, How long will, be ang will you be angry with me, Lord? Tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. And God said, My love and my light, my hope for you is not something far off. It is for today. It is now. It is here. I'm telling you, friends, the world is dark. 
I'm telling you that you go out these doors and that darkness will hit you like a cold north wind. It doesn't do us any good to pretend that the darkness is not there. But the hope is we have a light. The darkness cannot pierce. The darkness cannot overcome. We have a light, not just for an hour on a Sunday morning or a Saturday night. We have a light that we are called to carry out into the world. We light one candle today of hope. We will light candles of, of love and of joy. Eventually the, the Christ candle, the peace candle as well. But how do we carry this light into the world? It's your homework assignment. Pray. Pray. That's one thing that struck me yesterday and the thing with Mr. Rogers. He did not focus on his faith uh, a lot, but it did enough. And every night he had a, a journal and he just wrote down people's names. And 200, 300 names he would pray for, people he had met, people he had interacted with, people who wrote him letters. He would, he would pray every night. Spend some time in the Word. If you cannot commit to a year, commit to a season. Commit to four weeks. If you don't know where to start, start with Matthew or Mark or Luke or John. Just start reading and find in their hope. Read Romans and maybe, just maybe like St. Augustine, you'll find that these are not words of someone else, but these are words in the promise for you as well. Spend more time, spend more time serving instead of spending. When you leave the sanctuary, pay attention to the alternative, Christmas alternatives tables. Pay attention to the angel tree. Pay attention to the work of Isaiah 58 or Circle of Concern or piecemeal, or any of the other number of things out there. There's a need that is there. Some people will say, well, the darkness is so big, but we've seen the light, and we know the light wins. The night is nearly gone. The day is almost here. Let us get up. Let us wake up. We are closer to our salvation than we have ever been. Put the night and the darkness to rest and get up, friends. Because there is a light. And if there is a light, there is still hope. There is always hope. Now let us arise and live into it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen.